So I, I need to preface my talk as I did my introduction with uh, the caveat that I am giving this presentation solely in my uh, role as a private individual and uh, nothing that I say here should be construed as either the view of RAND, its sponsors, or my colleagues. So what happens when a nuclear bomb goes off? Uh, okay, thank you. So this is a question that's got two answers. Like, and those answers are, it depends, and we're not sure. So why is that? Well, the reason for this is because most of what we call nuclear weapons effects are indirect effects of nuclear weapons that result from the way that the weapon, the energy and everything else that comes out of the weapon when it, when it explodes interacts with what's in its immediate environment. So here we have uh, on the left a chart. I know it's a little small for you in the back, but the, basically we have this donut here, and this is where the energy of a nuclear explosion comes from. So this is for a pure fission device. So this is uh, something like the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima would be an equivalent to this. Um, and so this is the proportion of energy that comes out of a U-235 uh, uh, fission reaction. And so as you can see, the biggest chunk of the donut is kinetic energy of fission products. And other things we associate with nuclear weapons like neutrons and gamma radiation are a relatively small proportion of the overall output. So what you have here is most of it is quote unquote kinetic energy of fission products. That's sort of a complicated way to say heat. It's not exactly heat in our normal colloquial sense, but that's basically what it is. And so what this ends up doing is that it heats up the weapon itself. So as the weapon is detonating, it briefly still exists as a more or less intact thing, even though it's like turning into plasma essentially. And so momentarily it heats up to this enormously high temperature. It, uh, what that temperature is depends on sort of like the yield to weight ratio of the device. And most of this energy turns into soft x-rays that are coming off of the bomb casing. So the soft x-rays are different from the kind of x-rays that you get for like medical examination in that they don't go very far in air. So like most of the energy of the weapon is turned into these soft x-rays that are coming off the bomb casing, which is acting like a black body radiator. So it's like basically the same physical principle as an old fashioned incandescent light bulb, right? And where the bomb is the filament and it's just enormously hot and is radiating a black body spectrum that is so hot that it's up in the soft x-ray spectrum. And so soft x-rays only get a couple of feet in air. And so what you end up with is the beginnings of what we call the nuclear fireball. So what will happen in a nuclear weapon that's detonated in air is that most of the energy is these soft x-rays. Most of those are almost immediately absorbed by the, the air immediately around the device. This becomes sort of the nucleus of the fireball, which then begins rapidly expanding, shocks the air in front of it, and that's where you get your blast wave from. However, this is all dependent on the presence of the air, right? So... If you take the same nuclear device, exact same physics uh, up until the point when you get to that bomb case, and then you detonate it on the ground in the air, you get the what, something that looks like what's on the left, right? It's like you've got this explosion, and then it produces this shock wave in the air that then reflects off the ground. You get a mox stem. All these things that people think of usually as like, oh, what happens when a nuclear weapon goes off? It's like atomic bomb drop in Hiroshima. It's almost like, exactly like this, right? It's like you got basically flat ground weapon detonated in the air to height to optimize that mox stem. Well, you took like the exact same nuclear device and you, let's say you detonated in space. Say you detonated at an altitude of a few hundred kilometers above the earth. And you start getting very different looking physical effects because of the way that the energy is now interacting with the atmosphere and other things too. But the atmosphere, which is now, you know, like a hundred kilometers or more below it before you start getting to a palpable atmosphere. And so because of that, you don't have the opportunity for the, the, the fireball to form and the first thing that gets to the atmosphere are the, these prompt gammas that are coming off the device. And so they interact with the atmosphere and end up producing Compton electrons that end up turning in the Earth's magnetic field. And this is where a high altitude electromagnetic pulse, the early time high altitude electromagnetic pulse comes from. And so this principle applies to other kinds of detonation environments. So you know, underwater detonation environments, underground detonation environments, like the really complicated Stuff that happens when you detonate a weapon that's right at the threshold between two of these. So between water and air, earth and air, uh, and the energy gets partitioned into different spaces, you end up having these really dramatic transitions into what the weapon does. And these, this is not some sort of like abstract academic exercise. The way that nuclear weapons are intended to be used in, in war interact with all of these interesting edge cases resulting in very different looking physical effects. So because of that, we're not actually quite sure 
what a particular nuclear explosion will do because it is so complicated. This is an enormously complicated physical problem. And so it was difficult even back in the, the days of atmospheric nuclear testing when they, when they answered the problem is they would just go out and do it, right? It's like they were curious about nuclear weapons effects. They would go out and they would detonate a weapon in space or under the ground or in the ocean, see what would happen. Often what would happen was a bunch of surprises that took years sometimes, or even in, in many cases, have never really been resolved about it's like, oh, well, exactly how does the physics of this work? Because it'll turn out like, oh, it's this very tightly coupled problem. It's like, it's enormously complicated and we don't want to put in the resources to understanding it. So we're just going to use this simplified model for military planning and go forward. Well, if the idiosyncrasies of specific nuclear detonations matter and the data from atmospheric nuclear testing isn't sufficient, which it isn't not just because there are so many different cases, but also because nearly all of the nuclear weapons tests that were ever carried out were primarily for weapons development and not for studying nuclear weapons effect. Furthermore, doing the tests you would need to do in order to validate the nuclear weapons effects models for many of these use cases of military interest would have been so dangerous that even back in the 1950s when they did things that today are, would be considered just like unimaginably dangerous, were considered too dangerous even back then. And so because of that, like we don't have that much data to validate computer simulations against. So the modern solution, this is like, oh, we've got these supercomputers. We'll just model these nuclear explosions on our supercomputers. And it turns like, yeah, we don't have the data to like uh, parameterize our models. And furthermore, it turns out that the problems are so hard that even with a modern supercomputer, they're only kind of tractable and maybe not even uh, that much. So to give an example of just how different the real measured effects of a nuclear explosion can be from the nice idealized models that you'll find like in the famous Glassstone book. It's like the Glassstone book, last updated 1977. The Bible, supposedly of nuclear weapons effects, has these nice black blast effects curves in it. It looks like, and how many people just assume, it's like, oh, you just interpolate on this curve and this tells you what the blast effects of a nuclear explosion will be if you use it in real life. Well, here's data measured in the Priscilla test that took place at the Nevada test site, June 1957. And so the blue, the nice blue shock curves, that's the theoretical idealized projection. The, this red, these red jagged curves are the actual measurements from this test. As you can see, they're very different. And this is because of the interaction of different nuclear weapons effects in that blast environment. It's the thermal impulse coming off of the, of the fireball, preheating the ground, knocking up a bunch of dust, because there's a little bit of water in the, the soil, even in the Nevada test site, right? So this causes enough of that water to boil and then throws up a bunch of dust that's then heated by the latter part of the thermal impulse. And then you have this heated layer of dusty air above the surface, and it changes the way the blast propagates a lot in this case. And so the, the way American nuclear weapons effects scientists interpreted this back in the 50s is like, oh, well, this is a weird desert thing. We don't need to worry about this. We can use these idealized curves for military planning and for civil defense and all of that, and we'll be fine. So in the Soviet Union, they also saw effects like this much more extreme because they were doing their nuclear tests in a grassland. And so the, they would set off a weapon if there was dry grass, which in Kazakhstan is just that's the way it is in the, in the fall and lights the grass on fire, then you have like a layer of fire above the ground and that produces a much more extreme version of this effect. And so the Soviets in part, because much of their own country were these grasslands grew, drew the conclusion like, oh, well, we have to assume that these abnormalities are there. They tried to create a simplified model that so far as I can tell, the Russians still use for military planning that is very different from our default blast model. So here we have a nice 3D plot of our default model, like in the Glassstone book, versus this Russian model that the, tries to uh, in, account for these thermal precursor anomalies. And as you can see, it's like the, they're different by a factor of about two in many places. But the, where the difference is maximized depends on the height of burst. So it's like it's not just a simple conversion, like, oh, like it's always lower or higher. It's, uh, it's more complicated than that. And furthermore, the, these Russian models are themselves like highly simplified. It's like, it's not actually clear that this is significantly better than the American way of doing it, if at all, because it just gives what might just be another layer of false precision. So it also can be very hard to figure out what nuclear tests that we actually did, like what their effects were. So these are three different fallout reconstructions. I'm sorry that the one in the middle isn't very visible here. This is the best scan I have of it. These are three reconstructions of the fallout from the, the infamous March 1st, 1954 Castle Bravo test in the Pacific that created the notorious uh, fallout disaster that required the uh, uh, emergency evacuation of Marshall Islanders. So there is a lengthy story of how the AEC got the science wrong on this before the test that I don't have time to get into here. But basically what happened though, was that the, the AEC's 
scientific understanding of fallout prior to this test was just completely wrong. And that's the reason that they didn't take proper precautions for it. But furthermore, after the test, they had to try and figure out what had gone wrong and basically invented sort of like the, the science of fallout prediction modeling as it later came to exist. So different competing groups of uh, researchers produced different estimates of where the fallout had gone that were very different from each other. So there's the one on the left, uh, Air Force Special Weapons Project produced it. Uh, this is the one that's in the Glassstone book. It's almost certainly the least accurate of the three. The one in the middle is the research group at RAND. Uh, this was the output of the world's first computerized fallout model. And on the right, you have the Naval Radiological Defense Laboratory's estimate. And if you look closely, all of them are different. It's like all of them put sort of the hotspot in a different place because they're assuming different things about where the vision products were in the fallout cloud. So what does this mean for the impact of nuclear weapons effects on human beings? Well, it's like the uncertainties that I'm talking about probably compound. So it's once you start talking about it, it's like, well, we have uncertainties about this weapons effect and uncertainties about this other weapons effect. And like when we're worried about the way that those two weapons effects should interact, it's like, well, the uncertainties compound. So it's like, well, how does this going to impact people? It's like, well, it gets harder and harder the more we try and get into the details. And furthermore, it's like, well, what are those effects like the blast effects and the radiation effects and so forth? Like the uncertainties about those are if anything greater than about the nuclear weapons effects themselves, because we're not in a position to do controlled experiments for the obvious reasons. So like this question of like, well, how much radiation does it take on average to kill like a, like a healthy adult human being? There's an enormous scientific debate on this that has not been resolved for the obvious reasons that we can't do controlled tests. We try and work backwards from the atomic bombings in Japan, but the problem there is that there are all these confounders because it's like, well, the city had an atomic bomb dropped on it. Like most of the people who were killed seem to have been killed by things other than direct radiation effects. But so it was very difficult to try and infer from the people who for one reason or another happened to survive the blast and the fire and so forth it's like, okay, well, uh, how much radiation exposure did they really get? Because it's really hard to do the dose reconstructions. And furthermore, it's like, well, the people who didn't survive, how many of them would have died anyway? Uh, so the big takeaway is that the uncertainties about these issues are just enormous. Uh, like nobody can say with confidence, like exactly what would happen if nuclear weapons were used in war. And this is frankly should, uh, should it should concern all of us uh, because the back during the atmospheric testing era, it's like, well, there are a lot of nasty surprises like Castle Bravo probably being the most notorious, but it is far from the only one where it's like nuclear weapons were tested in some sort of new way, some sort of new device and some sort of horrible surprise materialized. Well, it's like there may be a lot more of those dragons lurking out there, things that would show up in case of a nuclear war that we haven't really anticipated yet. Uh, so on that, uh, that unnerving note, I will conclude. Uh, thank you very much.